um, we'll go ahead and say start in the chat. Uh, this is the R4DS Project Club, uh, where at once or every month we talk about something that we're working on that we find interesting. Um, before Ardalan Mershani uh, comes on, I just want to point out that we don't have a sign up yet for December. We'll be meeting on December 9th, and that slot is open. Um, if nobody signs up, I have some things I could talk about, but I've gone a couple of times, so I want to leave it open for someone else if, if someone else wants it. Um, but yeah, okay. Other than that, uh, without further ado, Ardalan Mersharni is going to talk to us about generative AI and the future of programming. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, John. Um, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, so let me share my screen. And do you have my screen? anyone can come to yes it. yeah i was gonna say sorry i couldn't get to my mute button oh um, okay no that's fine. <laughs> but yes that's fine yes, that's perfect because so, when you shared my things rearranged sorry about yeah, that yeah <laughs> no worries so yeah hello everyone my name is Adolan. i'm senior data scientist and ai product developer and today i'm going to talk about how the llm the large language models and like example of that if i gpt affect the future of data science and let's start with the agenda that I will uh, I will start with intro of the LLM, what is the large language models, and a little bit background, but very high level. And then we move to data science part that you all know this, but it's good that we have a um, high level overview of what is data, I mean, the intro, having an intro of the, the data science, and then we relate these two topics together. And at the end, we will have a sort of looking at the opportunity and challenges the, with, with the connections of these two these two fields. So let's start with the with the large language models. But before before continuing that, you will see different uh, images in my presentation that I should mention. All of them are created by Dolly Three. It's it's a it's a it's a model that generated by OpenAI that just transfer the text to images. So yeah. Uh, by the way, so uh, what is a large language model? By definition, so it's it's very it can be very complex, but if you want to simplify it a lot, so we can we can we can mention that it's, it might be something like a predictive tool that predict the text, and through these predictions, is create a word, it creates a line, a paragraph, and that can be anything. It can be code or other things that make sense, and this is the magic of that. And yeah, but the idea is that it just forecasts and predicts words in a sequential way. But in terms of the mechanics of this technology, it's, it's just, I mean, again, this is very simple explanation of that. It's going to be way more complex, but it's a giant matrix multiplication. And the whole, uh, the whole idea was just powered by a concept is called neural network that is inspired by the human's brain's neurons. And this is just the, the giant matrix that you just try to just find out the right numbers in this giant matrix and, and through that train the model that works based on what you want. And the whole thing, the whole concept is not new. So I think we had it like around 60 years ago, 70 years ago. And but it wasn't came to it, it didn't came to the to the application. Uh, till that we had a good advancement in the computation part empowered by the GPUs and also uh, emergence by the new model is called Transformers. It was a paper that released in Google uh, Research Lab 2017. And after that, like the combinations of these two just empowered us to have very powerful uh, large language models. Uh, Probably the most famous example of that is right now is Chat GPT. You all might know this, but this is a quick demo that you will take, you will prompt, and through the, the the prompt, so you can communicate with AI. In this example, I asked that just write a code with ggplot2, 
and you can see the output is a form of text, but part of the text is code. And the whole uh, beauty of this language model is that it understands the context and based on what you ask and the whole context it can generate and respond to you. So this this is just ChatGPT is an example of large language model, but you have a lot of different more uh, language models that and 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 they they will uh, be even more in the future definitely. Uh, but one important thing to mention here is that the large language model so it's, it works based on the based on text, but we can I mean people can be just creative and turn the text to any format of the output that can be that can communicate with with others so this is just a, a weekend project that we work on so we call it my lens the idea is that how we can ask ai to create a timeline of the historical event for us uh, the, the domain is my lens that ai if you want you can check it yourself as well but for example i just write it like the history of coffee, something like that. And if you just click the button, it generates a timeline based on the based on the topic. As you can see, like for every for each of the event, we can have a line. But again, you can see that this is a text spec, the text based output that we wrap it with a nice user interface and, and visualization. Then you will see that in a in a form of animation mode and you can share it with others. I want to just mention that these are part of the example that people can do many things with the text. So text would be the core of the whole topic, but if you want, you can wrap it and create uh, many more things that hopefully can help like, like make the life easier and, and help on, on many of the projects that we are working on. Uh, the last two or three pages was very simple sort of explanations and ideas about what is large language model from very high level overview. But let's take a look from the other side of, or, uh, of the topic that today we are gonna uh, explore more, which is the data science. So data science is just combined and connection of different fields. So statistics, mathematics, computer science, and definitely one side is based on the business knowledge and the, the data we have and how we want to just get the insight from the data, the, the whole topic around the, around, the, around the domain that data is available on. Uh, the, object, the main objective probably of the data science is extracting knowledge from the data. And through the extracting knowledge, we want to make some decisions. It can be just maybe just decision-making support in in different fields, in industry, in research, or maybe it can be like the application can be different. It can be like part of the, the tool. Like if you watch a video on YouTube, so, and you will see that there is a recommended videos in a size. So this is based on some sort of recommendation system modeling that's just understand what the trend of your uh, your interest sort of and, and suggest the thing that might relate to more and for the for the next one and these are all the different and you, I mean we can find it anywhere around us uh, but maybe again high level we, we can see that the whole concept is that we have a data how we want to extract the insight from the data and make some decisions on that um, but there are very complex if if i mean data data science as a title is is very generic sort of and it's it's completely different from one institute to another one one company to another one but i try to from one maybe from my lens try to summarize a little bit how a, a person as a data scientist or a team in the uh, analytics group uh, what are their workflows? So, and what are probably after this, based on this knowledge, we can see that what are the challenges in the, in the data science things? Maybe one of the, the, the main, I mean, maybe we can categorize, I mean, I categorize it into six to, to six groups, definitely can be more than this, but maybe we can start with data collection. So this, this, is, this is part of the thing that people will start with that, that gathering the raw data from, many times from the various sources. 
they try to bring into their own system and try to do the pre-processing, cleaning this data and make it ready for the analysis. When the data is ready and the next step is that we explore the data a little bit more to understand if there is any, I don't know, caveats in the data, anomalies in the data, get some sense about how this data looks like. And then after this, we go for the modeling part. So it can be like, again, the modeling is very generic. It can be different from one field to another, but we choose based on what we need, based on what the insights we are looking uh, uh, on. We go and select the algorithm, try to creating the model, validate the model. And then when we are happy with the result and see that this, this makes sense based on what we want. So we will deploy it. It can be, I don't know, it can, even the deployment can be just communicating the result. Imagine just sharing the report with some stakeholders or creating a dashboard for people, or imagine you have the YouTube and you want to just embed the, the model as part of the recommendation system. Uh, when you do that and when you, you finalize the deployment, so monitoring and maintenance, again, is going to be a big thing that over time you will work with the new infrastructure, I don't know, new upgrade. So the model relevance is important over time. You want to feed more data and, and make the accurate, and increase the accuracy. So this can be probably uh, the last stage that it, it needs an attention that over time you need to you need to update and make sure everything works well based on what you want. Um, more or less, this is sort of the workflow that we are as a team even working on in a data science group. But definitely there are many challenges. Many people thought that, okay, coding is part of the challenges that we know how to code and how to make it better, how to increase the performance. But we saw that data itself is a big challenge, that when they come from various sources, how you can integrate them, how to can just maintain the data that you have and how it works with the infrastructure you already had in your, your group, because uh, many times you are working in a team, in a company, and the, there is some sort of uh, limited infrastructure that you need to work with that because of the privacy and accuracy and the speed and anything like uh, the sensitivity of the data. Uh, these are, each of them are, can be part of the challenge. And I try to, again, group them into six categories and take a look at that. So starting with data management, that how we as a team in a real world cases handle the high volume of the data, how we can connect it to multiple platforms that uh, they store the data and want to bring it, uh, bring in for the analysis, how we want to deal with that. Uh, data cleaning and preparation. So the whole concept is that raw data is not ready for the analysis. And, and data analysts, data scientists, many times spend a lot of time to turn it to analysis, what I call it analysis ready data. It can be, again, like cleaning is part of that, but it's not all, the, all related to the cleaning. It can be just connecting everything together based on the tool that you have that you want to start the analysis. So operation and change is also a, a definitely a real world challenge when you are working in a company, there is an IT, there is a setup tools uh, that, and, and you need to deal with that. And you want if, if you want to just work on the performance, the resource allocation, the organizational changes, all the things might happen and you need to deal with that every day, every week, if you want to just maintain a longer term project, a data project. A model lifecycle, reusability, integration, continuous monitoring is all the thing that we we deal uh, we need to deal with it. So privacy again is, is is very important, and there are a lot of concerns around it that how you can keep uh, the information safe and uh, through the the connections of different platforms and and creating the models that you want to work on. And the last part is the communication that you want to communicate the results with others, but their backgrounds are different and they might not know as you know the data science. And it's going to be a challenge over time that how you communicate this result with the person with, with 
different and diverse background and transfer the knowledge to them. So it again, this this might be much more than just the challenges in a real world data science, but I try to just connect the challenges with the workflow. I mean, these are again the simple category of the challenges. And but but we see that there is a sort of one-on-one -on -one connection with, with the workflow that in each group there is big challenges in real world data science. Um I think right until now we have a we have a little bit understanding of what is LLM and what is data science and what is the data science challenges. And right now we can ask ourselves, is large language model can be assumed as a new coding language? Because we saw that part of the, 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 the thing that the LLM is doing for us is that trans, you can ask, you can prompt, you can ask a question and it can answer you. And you can ask to generate a code and the AI and LLM can do. And we saw that part of the challenge in data science is also related to the coding part, the performance of the coding and how we can make it better and faster. So this is the question that is, is LLM can do that for us without, uh, without we make sure, I mean, it, it doesn't matter that we know how much we have the, the knowledge and the skill and the coding part can we communicate with the with the AI, with the LLM, with the natural language and make sure it can write the code and we don't care about the code, but we will be, just be happy about the result. If this works so, we might be able to consider the LLM as the future of coding language. So 40 years ago, we had like C++, Pascal, many of this uh, harder, uh, I can say, coding languages and right now data scientists working with R Python much more easier. So there is a big community. Everyone is creating the library and packages and we can easily reuse them. So we don't need to just spend a lot of time to make sure about the coding part. So we, we, we could say that this trend is, is going through to streamline everything, make it simplified and maybe can we ask that the LLM is, is the next, is the future language model that in another round make it more simple that you don't care about the syntax and anything. You just ask a question and even you don't care about the language. So you don't care about R and Python and the environment packages, anything. You just ask you a question and it goes and write the code and just generate the output and you will be happy. So. Before answering this question, or maybe before answering this question, it's good that we compare these two ones a little bit more. What is the, the fundamental difference between an LLM and a computer coding language? So it's important to see that a computer coding language, something like Python and R, these are rule-based operations. So there are some syntax, there are some rules, there are environments that you work with that, you write stored up function or request statement in, in the environment and you get the result based on some rules. But LLM is not that one. So it's a learning based prediction. So you ask something and it tries to predict one word after other one in a sequenced way. And many times it makes sense. And because of that, it works like a magic, but it's, it's not deterministic. It's not rule based. It's a probabilistic uh, sort of uh, coding language and if you want to just consider that and we know that the computer coding is very structured there is input there is output but in LLM you can even engage in a dialogue so everything cannot be just code so you can just communicate some part of that is just outputting the the, the context or maybe just back and forth question answer to just make sure about what should be coded. And then part of that can be a code. So it's, it's just a different structure. And, uh, but, but LLM is definitely much, much, much more easier. So it's just based on the natural language. So you don't need to care about the, the syntax and everything. So these are maybe again, two, like the, in, in four categories, the difference between the coding languages and LLM. 
And uh, but but uh, back to the question that if LLM can be the future of coding languages, at least in, in a data science, uh, I think it's a good time that we take a look at the history of the may, maybe some some examples of the LLM in data science and how they helped in the past few years. Uh, Definitely one of the one of the most uh, one of the more one of the important uh, tools that in the, uh, the the LLM tool in data science and GitHub Copilot is released in twenty twenty one. It's an AI powered code assistant, uh, like um, code working in in VS Code that you can uh, write a command. As you can see here, you just write a, a sort of a, a common line, a document. Uh, a inline comment and it just generate the code that comes after and through this process it understand your environment and can just auto complete the code that you have and over time just helps you more and more because you are just creating your your projects with with more functions and data and many many uh, of the many parts you just need to hit the tap on, on your keyboard and just auto completed and and it just boosts the, the efficiency and the speed of writing codes and accuracy as well. So GitHub Copilot is one of the a very important example in this field. And Chat GPT also itself has a specific plugin. It's called Code Interpreter. So in the back end of that, there is a Python environment that you ask a question and it just turn it to the code and the code is being executed on the Python environment. And then you will see that you will have the, the result. You can check the, the code as well, but as you can see here, so it just generate the table, the, the visualization, and it goes more and more and you will see the answer. So it's, it's pretty interesting, the whole idea that how fast the natural, the large language model can come in and turn a request to a code executed and give me the answer. And many people just raise, like in, maybe like in, in the community, raise a question that if the data analysis or maybe the data analyst will be replaced through this process, okay, ChatGPT can do anything. Uh, I think what is good that we back to the challenges that how how what 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 were, were the challenges in the real time real world data science and if chat gpt can or cannot solve it or maybe if there are something that cannot solve it now but maybe will solve in future i want to just take a look at these challenges uh, more and explore it uh, with, with 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 having an eye on the on the llm as well um, before taking a look at the challenges, so I think a good question here is that if if you experience with ChatGPT more and more, you see that it's it's form of a reactive LLM. So it means that you ask a question, it answer you, and this is part of the big challenges here. That many times it it really depends on the on the question or the prompt you ask the ChatGPT that what to do for you, but one of the fair point here is that if if the if if it can just remove the human in this reactivity loop so maybe if if we can some having some sort of system that people can rely on without asking more and just giving a, a sort of task and mission to the ai and it can go and do them for uh, do it for them so it is, it is going to be a big thing because in that case, we can sort of chunk a big project to a smaller task and make sure each of the tasks can, can do pretty well, can be, can, can be executed uh, exactly based on what we want. And then at the, end, uh, at the end of the project, we will have everything completed. So can, can AI be autonomous with, and without people's help can go and solve a project? So in, in, in the context of the AI and large language model, we have a concept that's called agent that, that, is, that is doing like this. So agent is an autonomous entity that perceives the environment that you're working on. And based on the mission and based on the, the, the task that it has, it just do a different round of actions and observe the output of the actions and if there is any problem, it tries to use 
any tools that it has in hands. Like one of the tool like can be accessing to Python environment. Maybe one other tool can be just access to Google API to just search if if it's just looking. Imagine that how a data analyst works that you write a code, there is a bug you don't understand, you search on a stack overflow, get the, the answer and fix your code. And through this process, so you try to step by step solving a big data analysis project. Uh, in AI also, we have an agent that is good that at least we know the terminology here that it's, it's an autonomous entity and people are working on this agent uh, for, for a specific task that do and, and finish the, the task uh, pretty accurate based on what people, based on, based, on, based on the mission that the agent has. But definitely there are many challenges in the agent. Uh, it's, first of all, is the predictability that how people can predict that it does the thing that is pretty accurate and it doesn't, and people can trust it, trust the output. And because it access the tools more and more, how it gonna use this, this tools and again, the privacy, the ethical part is, is also a big part of these challenges. But we will see that um, this agentic sort of AI is, is a big trend right now that in any field, so people, people try to creating some agent to be autonomous and end-to-end -end solve a project. But uh, back to the challenges, I mean, I, I just introduced agent here to, to understand that this is going to be the thing that people are working on in the probably real world challenges. And if you have a specific challenge and if you can define a specific agent to solve it, probably at the end, you can have a network of agent communicate together better to solve a bigger problem. Uh, and this part is just coming from my personal experience. So uh, we started working on a uh, uh, a tool is called data model and data model and mission was that it's going to just help non people without data literacy to do the data analysis in real time and get data driven decisions uh, just just yeah in, in real time they don't need to wait that much time to solve their own problem they wanted to just democratize this data science to any professional uh, and we thought that, okay, if we want to do, there are tons of challenges here that we cannot solve it, but maybe we can start with some of the big challenges and creating some agents for, for, for the challenges. We started with the, with the analysis part, like how, how nice the AI can just turn the text into the, the code, but Honestly, it wasn't the main challenge. So through the creating the, the an AI agent that can do the data analysis, we found out one of the big, one of the fundamental problem, as I explained and, and introduced it before, it's that the data is not ready for writing codes. So for many of the for many of this AI, like Chat GPT code interpreter and a lot of different things, if you search, you will find it. If the, the data is very simple and nice and clean, like in a CSV, clean format, you give it and many people like prompt something like, give me 10 nice visualization, but this is not what people do in the, in the real world. So you don't work in a team and your manager ask that, give me some beautiful visualization, right? I mean, there are specific business problems that you go and try to solve it. And you want to make it uh, make the results very accurate, uh, and this is this is a big challenge that having LLM in the data science that you you, you don't want LLM create for you like an art, an image, or maybe a story because there is no not that much good and bad in the quality of that. So you may like it or not, but you can you I mean you are fine if just generate a story or image for you. You can say that okay, it's good and. But, but in data science, it's completely different. It's gonna be, the code is gonna be rendered in, a, in an environment. So definitely it should work and it should return what you want. But the, the important part is that, is, it ex is the AI exactly doing what I wanted and what I had in my mind? 
And the main fundamental problem we found was that the data preparation, that the, in real world problems, usually the data is not clean enough, is not ready enough for the analysis. So it's just scattered around different sources. So you need to bring them in, clean it, connect it nice. And then based on that, you can bring it the AI to just solve one part of the question more accurate. So because of that, we started working on the data preparation part that see how AI can work on the messy data. If we can create a sort of agent to working with the unclean data and make it ready for the analysis. The second problem that we, we found out and we think that if AI in the future will come in a data science field more and more is about the question part that the formulating user question. If you again work with chat GPT, you may ask that like for five nice visualization and it's fine because it's an open-ended question that AI can do anything. But if you have something very specific in your, your mind, so, and you ask that, you will see that the problem comes out that what he's doing might not exactly based on what you had in your mind. And it's, I think very important that we have some sort of AI to just understand what we wanted and formulate our questions better. And it's not gonna be just what we ask the AI, but I think part of our experiences shows that the memory of the AI is so important that if the AI, if you are working with an AI more than a year and you already answer a lot of different questions based on your teams or companies or I don't know, research labs uh, questions. So the AI understand you more and more. And if you ask right now something, it might use and leverage some of the previous memory and just formulate your questions better and turn it to the version that, uh, that the output is aligned based on what exactly you wanted. Advanced analysis is part of the thing that people will see, are, are seeing more and it's just the turning the text into the code. But the challenge is, is about the infrastructure part that how this auto code and and everything is aligned based on the environment you have. If imagine that all the all the uh, the the dependency are accessible by the AI, it, it it can access to the tool. And again, the speed and accuracy of that is so important. There are many smaller things that make some bigger problems in the advanced analysis. If you want to work with AI in the real world cases, and this is the last uh, slide here about the actionable decision that I'm very excited about this part, that many times even you do the analysis, <clears throat> you clean the data, bring them in, ask the right question and do the advanced analysis, you get some answers that is nice and you can definitely share with others. But I think the whole beauty of this part is that how we can leverage all of the previous memory of our teams maybe it's not even in our team imagine a bigger company there are a lot of different groups working on on their own data but if we can have a sort of system or tool that uh, understand the output of what we get from the analysis and sort of related to the, the previous decision we made and based on all this it can generate some sort of actionable decision for us and the beauty of that is we might not be aware of some of the other decisions that the company or other teams made, but if 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 the tool understood them, the the, the whole the decision, so it might give us like sort of it enrich the decision that we can take from the from the output of the analysis. And I think after all of this, after cleaning data, uh, asking the right question, doing the analysis, making the decisions. The big question is that if AI also can come and do some actions on this decision. So if there is, imagine that, so if, if all this happens and the AI can do this in an agentic way, maybe the next step is that it do some of the actions, the smaller actions pretty well and just save a lot of time. So for example, just email you the interesting insight that it can get from the analysis. So you just wake up like, I don't know, every Friday in the morning and you will see that they are just send you some of the insightful uh, things that it just understood from your data. 
but this is this is a smaller thing but actions can be very big area and also to me it's very challenging that because when it does the action it's just communicate with other tools and again it might be way more challenging than just writing code in your environment and getting that the that, that answer this is the part that i think people are also working more and more on that to having some agents to do some specific things and yeah we are also part of this i mean we are just experiencing and just excited about the field and i personally see that there are way more opportunities than, I mean, definitely there are some concerns in the field that how AI is dealing with, but I mean, I found personally, I personally found it as part of the, the, the new technology, the thing that is coming and hopefully we can understand the opportunity and challenges better and hopefully position ourselves better to learn it and yeah, grow it with that more. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, so I, I am curious if, like, would you trust the output of an AI data scientist? Would you would you act on it? Because mm, yeah, no, it's it's a very good question. The the short answer is no, and because <laughs> of that, right now the whole process is that people just getting the code and trying to having someone to double check the code that it does make sense or not. But it seems that it's getting better and better with having more agent in the in the system. So what what I think is that right now, I mean, I think people in community at this like 2023 think that many things have solved because they can see that the the the, the natural language can be turned into code. But I think there are a lot more because the field of data science is all based on the accuracy and exactly rely on what right. you need to get. And I think there are a lot more to, to work on that. And I think we are just, yeah, just one piece think, of the puzzle. I mean, are we on the right path to get to that? Because LLMs aren't trained on accuracy. They're trained on sounding like a thing a person would say. Yes. So, I mean, I don't know. Do you do you think that we're on the right what, path to get to accuracy? I, I, I didn't know about the the whole. <laughs> the, the, what I believe is that there are many projects that is not in the right path, because to me they are thinking of we are going to solve all the pro all the problems in that field like with an AI. So what at least I found it more uh, probably valuable is that just starting with, with smaller tasks that like very, very small things that if even like the source of the data can be important. So if, for example, the, the form of the database, the AI can do better because everything is structured and the relation can be understandable for the AI better. But yeah, if, if you think about different parts, there are a lot of different challenges that I think we cannot solve it all at once with the better AI that come out. And but but we need to just focus on smaller problems and just solve it. Fair enough. Does anyone else have any questions, comments? Okay, I All have right. some. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, some questions. Um, so the, I've uh, been playing with this data motto, and I found it somehow very useful. Uh, but I have uh, just uh, get the uh, uh, the chance to uh, to tell you. For example, I just throw in a, a certain type of data which they weren't like such as uh, very well formatted. And um, so how this tool actually works with data. So when you put data in it, what's happened basically? Uh, the whole framework that we found it beneficial to work on is, is comprises on 
four different agents. So data question analysis and decision. So, and the, 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 the first two agents, which is the data preparation and question formulating is, 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 is something that comes be, before the analysis part, because we found out if you just add the data to the AI and ask doing some analysis or some code, it cannot solve it. The accuracy is very low because it just goes through the unlimited loop of error to preparing the data based on what you wanted. And then many times you cannot control it. Just do the analysis that is not what you ask and give you some answer that you didn't want. Because of that, the, pro the framework that we are building is that try to be more to be more accurate is that we are just building a two AI agent before the, the time that is going to write the code for people. Because, because the whole backend part is that is access to the coding languages, the Python and R and SQL, these three main language in data science. But uh, we found out the AI cannot just initially uh, started with writing code for every like general use cases. When you add the data, we when we went the data through a data cleaning service that it tries to improve the quality of the data and make it ready with AI. And because of that, I was uh, mentioning to to John that we start we should start with a smaller projects and a smaller task to like how the AI can just clean. I don't know the. That I mean, dealing with missing values, for example, something like this. And if we have the agent that completely designed to handle just the missing value, well, I think this is this is a, this is this is like one step forward to this journey that solve this problem, and then go for another part of cleaning and another one, and try to have something that I mean, my keyboard is accuracy that that increase the accuracy of the service, and yeah, I mean. We went through a sort of data cleaning when you add the data. Then we had another agent that tried to formulate your question better, that make sure even through a communication is exactly what you ask. Because many times when we write a code, we write some when we write the questions, we write something that is different. At least the AI understand it differently than what we have in our mind. So we try to, yeah, I mean, the whole probably two main player in our uh, framework is that the data cleaning and question formulating before the AI writing the code. Thank you. So just um, well, by your side, okay, with your experience and uh, all, the, all your uh, practice um, time spent uh, on uh, building this tool and so working on the language models and everything. What makes the difference with humans? So what 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 humans do better? What is the key uh, that the human that a human can do uh, key elements that a human can do uh, other than an AI tool? Uh, let me repeat the question that make sure that I understand. So you see that if we empower by accessing this AI, after this, what human can do that the AI cannot? Is that the question? Yeah. So what 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 do you foresee that uh, a human yeah. uh, can uh, can so human is the key, no? It's provide the input and uh, it, any output released by an AI tool uh, somehow need to be assessed and modified and adjusted mm -hmm. to uh, respond correctly, no? So yeah. how would you define the human input on the AI? What's the difference between a human input and uh, an, an automatic input from an uh, AI tool? Yeah. Uh at least in our framework, what we think, this is not we completely build it yet, but we are in the track to build it, is that we define the input as one of them is the data. So it can be the data that the, the user directly input to the AI, 
it can be the 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 the, the data that people are not aware of that, but if the AI can access to the public data resources and bring them in the relevant data, it might definitely help a lot that enrich the data that people input. We have a sort of the direct prompt that the user, just the, the real time user question. And the sort of the hidden input that we also consider is the memory of all the previous things that the AI specifically uh, work for the user and for the team. And if the AI can access to them as well, it can enrich the user's question. And with three sort of the input resource or data or question agent is working to formulate the question better and make sure that it just turns the user real-time input, the user in, input, the real-time question into what exactly the user means and wants. All right, anyone else have questions or comments? Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think this is a topic that we're probably going to continue to hear quite a lot about. Um, uh, and I suspect it's one that we're gonna hear um, that it will soon replace people we will hear that for the next 10 or 15 years. Um, so... <laughs> no, I agree with you. <laughs> I think it's more, the, yeah. Well, uh, the, way, the way that I like to think about it is that it will displace people, not replace people. So they're going to end up somewhere else. Possibly, yes. If um, we'll but ahead. Yeah, I, I think, I, I mean, I don't know. I think that um, we probably will make some advancements, but I think it's not where people think it is in a lot of ways. And I actually worry about a lot of people just taking it and saying, well, it gave me an answer that must be true. Well, uh, like there was just the, what is the name of it? That someone has the little badge thingy that like communicates with chat GBT and they released a video of how cool it is. You can oh, just yes. ask it things and it, and it gives you an answer. And in their product video, the answers it gives are wrong, but it sounds right. And so, they didn't even check that for their own video. Um, so, it was, you know, it was a TED talk, I think. Was it? Oh. Yeah, it was on. It was on the TED stage, and it was. Wow. You're right. It was a little bat lapel, little lapel thing with a with an infrared camera, and he would just like but, it would project onto his hand the answers and everything. Yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, you know, use caution. Caution. I will say, you know, Copilot and that kind of thing is very cool, and it can be very helpful. Just you know, use it with caution, pay attention to what it's doing because <laughs> they are not automatic yet. Um, of course, totally talked agree. about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, uh, so I will see everybody on uh, on Slack and next month um, I will talk if no one else signs up. <laughs> so, all right, see ya. Have a good day. Bye.